and welcome everyone to our webinar today on youth mental health uh, and how we can make sure we can get the assistance needed where it is needed. So my name is Bronwyn Clark, I'm the Executive Officer of the National Growth Areas Alliance and I'm really pleased that we can bring this conversation to you today um, and make use of the expertise we have on our panel uh, this afternoon. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm meeting with you today on the lands of the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past and present and acknowledge that on new suburbs and, and, and new communities are being built on, on traditional lands right across Australia. Today we have participants from right across our membership and across four states. Uh, and I think that shows the importance of this conversation um, the ongoing and long-term importance of youth mental health as, an, as a challenge and an advocacy priority for our members, and the fact that it has now been brought into very sharp focus um, during this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, while um, we hope that, you know, by hearing the story and experience of Camden Council today, we can get some really great insights for all those other councils who are in a very similar situation. Um, and we, you know, we hope to be able to really better understand some processes, some opportunities and, and how we can make change in, for young people in our communities. Um, after all, in growth areas nationally, there are about 1.7 million people under the age of 25. And we know that even before uh, COVID-19, but certainly during and after um, youth unemployment and disengagement rates are much higher in our areas than across um, the national average. So I'd like to just introduce our panellists today and then um, we'll hand over in the order that I introduced them. So our first speaker will be Tina Chappell, who's the Director of Sport, Community and Activation at Camden Council. And she'll be talking about um, her municipality and the story of young people in Camden um, and work she's been doing on the youth strategy and, and how council really led the push um, to secure a headspace presence, presence in, the, in the municipality. Uh, we'll then hear from Aysen Gertepi, who's the clinical services manager at Headspace Campbelltown, um, a wealth of expertise um, is sitting right up here in ASIN and we really can't wait to, to hear her um, contribution about um, how Headspace works and, and, and the sort of the data that's really important to, to support a case um, for establishing a presence. We'll then hear from um, Councillor Charisma Kaliando, who's wearing a number of hats today, <laughs> I think. So um, good luck with that. But, um, Charisma is a councillor with Liverpool City Council. She also is a community engagement and development officer with Headspace. And she's a member of NGAA Strategic Advisory Committee. So we'll be looking to her to share some insights on, on what the future looks like for young people um, in her area and, and in growth areas. And then, you know, lead that discussion on what does a national advocacy body like NGAA um, have to do in this space and, and what can we do? So before we kick off, um, just a little bit of housekeeping for everyone watching in and, and the panelists as well, actually. I'll just get you to um, keep your microphone muted unless you're speaking. Um, we will have a Q&A session at probably a good half an hour at the end. So down at the bottom of your screen, um, you'll see a Q&A box and if you, you can post questions in there and um, we will come to them um, when we get to the Q&A session. We are recording this webinar, I'll let you know. So um, we will be making it available on our website um, towards the end of this week. So thank you all for being here. And I'd like to hand over to Tina to kick off the conversation. Well, thank you very thank much, Bronwyn. Um, I think it's fair to say mental health is a really important subject for, for Camden Council and our community more widely. Um, from a, a wellbeing perspective, it's, it's really important for us to be leaders for our community when it comes to talking about mental health and advocating for those services. 
So it's actually a real honour for me to get to speak on the subject today and, and also to get to partner up with our, our very strong local advocates in ASUN and, and Charisma and to you know, speak about the Camden experience. So for those who don't know Camden, and, and you know, I would expect that everyone would, but <laughs> for those that don't, we're located about an hour from the Sydney um, CBD, about 15 minutes from the, the future second Sydney airport. Um, I think it's fair to say, historically, we're not known for our growth. Historically, we're known for our rural environment and our, our European heritage. But since 2007, we've been um, in a, a dedicated um, growth area um, as identified by state government. So we're in what's um, termed the Southwest growth area. So in, in terms of our demographics, and I was having a look at these this morning and I thought, well, we're celebrating 20 years of the Sydney Olympic Games today. So in 2020, whilst the Olympic Games were happening, Camden had a population of 43,000, which I think is, is quite mind blowing to, to think we're probably nearing the 120 mark as we speak. So it's really been, and, and you know, Ron, the general manager is listening into this, he'd like this, it's been a tsunami of growth. And we refer to this a lot in Camden that we, we knew the growth was coming, but it's very much come very, very quickly. In the last five years, we've really seen that tsunami of growth come through. Last year, we averaged around about 114 new residents per week coming into Camden LGA. So I think um, across the, the country, we're actually the fastest growing local government area last year across that period. So it really does speak to the, the volume of change and growth. In terms of the cohort um, demographically, we're seeing, um, no surprise, we're, we're seeing um, first home buyers, young families. So predominantly, you know, the five to 19 years age group. Um, the five-year-olds that arrived here, you know, 10 years ago as part of our first part of growth are, are now in that, that youth cohort um, fairly and squarely. Um, so it's a really important area for us in, in terms of you know, the youth related services and, and making sure that we're, we're looking at those services for our community. The other the key piece um, for us is the, the shifting demographic we're seeing as well. Um, traditionally, Camden was a, a very much a, a European Australian um, area. We are seeing increasing um, cultural diversity as we continue to grow and as we get those new homeowners coming into our LGA. So it's been really important for us from a, a youth perspective that we are adapting how we deliver our services as a council, but also how we plan for the future cultural diversity um, that comes into our LGA as well. Um, by the year 2036, we're estimated to have a population of around about 230,000, um, which is you know, doubling again pretty much where we are today. Um, those figures were done a couple of years ago now before we you know, had talk of a train line coming through Camden as well. So I do think when we get to 2036, we'll probably be talking slightly higher numbers or more growth to come for Camden as we move forward, um, which is a bit daunting, but also a bit exciting in terms of what that can bring with it. So I think it's been fair to say that we've been you know, hard at work looking at that hard infrastructure, looking at our, our built form infrastructure to support our communities. But it's also really important from Camden's perspective, we're, we're looking at that social and human infrastructure as part of that ongoing planning. And it, it's so vital in supporting a community. You know, we're not just about building houses, we have to be about building those communities and, and putting in those structures that can support the, the social infrastructure and, and develop that social capital as we move forward. Camden, in terms of our geographic um, area, have been heavily reliant on services coming out of our major centres, which is our Campbelltown and, and Liverpool key centres. So Campbelltown is probably about 15 minutes to the east and, and Liverpool probably about 25 minutes to, um, to, towards the city. Um, that's in good traffic. I think in bad traffic, it's probably about an hour and an hour and 30. So that does change. But I think it's been really important for us not to be reliant on those services in those key areas, that we have to start growing our own services here in Camden and providing the, the, the basis, I guess, for those services and not just having you know, purely outreach services coming from Campbelltown and coming from Liverpool. So that's been a really you know, key part of our philosophy is very much about seeding, if you will, for, for community organisations here in Camden and helping them grow with our community and, and mature with our community um, more widely so that we very much have, you know, homegrown community services and, and social service organisations that know our community and know how to support our community as well. I, I think it's, it's fair to say anecdotally, we were very much aware of the growing need to provide youth services, not just youth services, but accessible youth services that were Camden located. Um, in particular, the, the growing demand around mental health. I, I think it's fair to say, 
originally we didn't have the hard data, the really hard data to throw at, you know, um, state government or New South Wales Health or anyone like that to say, look, we know this is a need. And, and that tends to be a bit of the, the case for greenfield development, that you're planning years and ahead of a community that doesn't yet exist. So it's, it's really hard to you know, rely purely on that evidence-based approach to, to go and lobby for, for services and organisations to come out here, because it's very much about addressing that latent need for services. You know it's there, but we haven't quite got the evidence yet to, to support that more widely. Um, so for us, it was a really key, almost a, a trust your gut decision in terms of what we were hearing from our key partners like Headspace and, and you know, Trackside and, and other you know, mental health services that we knew there was a demand there, it was building up and we really needed to address that and trust our gut and be a bit proactive with it. I think you know, with any of these community services, I think the key message is to be proactive. If you wait until the data backs you up, it's too late. We're already in a, an area of disadvantage or vulnerability. So to be you know, proactive and move forward as much as we can with our key partners and to you know, get services on the ground as early as we can. I think almost coincidentally, as we're kind of coming to that realization that we needed to get ahead of the, the ball game, so to speak, with these services, we're in the process of developing and designing our um, Oran Park Library. When we, we look at our community services and, and particularly the Oran Park Library here in, in, in Oran Park, it was not about just putting a building there with books and computers. It was very much about this must be the center of our community. Um, Greenfield, you know, areas that it's always the last thing I guess that comes on board. You get your, your residents in here first, you get your roads and you get your drainage and all that sort of stuff, but your social infrastructure is the last piece of the puzzle, I guess. So it was really important when we started to look at what the library would be that we integrated with that some community service space um, and some community hub space. So it was very much a place that the community could go to, to hang out, go to their after school karate lessons, um, go and get a book, go and study for their HSC, but also be able to access through those soft entry points, um, mental health service and community support services more generally. Um, and that's really, I guess, the, the essence of, of where we, we you know, the Headspace Oran Park component um, was born. And, you know, we were very, very fortunate, and I know Asen will speak to this in more detail, to have a really strong advocate in Asen who knows Camden extremely well, um, knew what the, the, the data was suggesting, and, and knew that this was something that we really needed to get here in Camden and, and in Oran Park. And having those, those strong advocates really helped us move ahead. Um, again, I think quite fortunately, we had a lot of support politically as well. Um, we, our council laws were very supportive of, of looking at something like this um, and really moving ahead of, of time, I guess, in terms of putting services in that space. Uh, so that was you know, really important that we had that executive level support and that political support to move forward on, on getting a community organisation into that, that library space really quickly. Um, and we've concluded the construction of the library in 2018. And I, I think we had Headspace in there about a couple of months after we finished the, the construction. Um, originally, we had one day, so Campbell's, Campbelltown Headspace that comes across here, had them for one day in that building. Um, we're very pleased to say in the last couple of months, we've actually extended that to a three-day utilisation and that the rest of those community spaces in that library are now fully utilised. So the, I think the model's been really successful in terms of You've got to, I guess, trust your gut and get the services in there. And once you get one lead service in there, it makes it a lot easier to, to keep getting other service organisations joining you. Um, and that's been you know, absolutely fantastic for our community. Um, and you know, as I'm sure Ace and um, we'll talk to some of the figures coming out in terms of the Camden youth use, utilising that service are really strong. And it's really been an exercise in, um, you know, uh, research, evidence-based research being, you know, emphasised through that data after the fact. So we've, we've managed to say, look, we know it's going to happen. We've got headspace in there and the data is really backing us up now and, and supporting that decision and will hopefully support us moving forward with similar type decisions as we continue to grow um, for the next, you know, 20 odd years. Um, so that's pretty exciting. In terms of 2020, um, we're now in a really fortunate position. We have our lovely library next door to me here, um, which has got that community space. We've also just finished um, development in conjunction with one of our development partners on a, a youth specific um, facility here in Oran Park. 
which again really emphasises that model of soft entry points. It's a, a fantastic youth facility with a, a massive skate park and basketball courts and things like that. And we're looking to, to work with our partners um, around the MacArthur area to have services operating out of that youth service, uh, youth space, sorry, so that we can again get that soft entry point in and really start building the capacity of our um, youth service providers in the Camden LGA. We're also using that really strong basis to, to forward, um, move forward on our, our youth strategy. Um, I spoke to the fact that when we started thinking about what we're doing here in Oran Park, we didn't have a community to engage. Um, so it was a little bit of, okay, we're planning for people we know will come, but we don't really know what their needs are, um, but we've just got to take a stab in the dark. We're in a really fortunate position now that we do have a, a community in here, um, and we've got a really strong and, and vocal um, youth, which is fantastic. So we now have an opportunity to engage with our community around this new youth strategy that we're currently um, developing. And for it to be embedded um, in our community as it comes from the, the bottom up, from the, the youth that are, are working on developing it. Um, it'll be a strategy that really embraces that diversity that I spoke to and, and will embrace what we need to be moving forward into the future and something which I'm, I'm really excited about. Um, the team in, in conjunction with our Youth Council have started our initial consultation and engagement on it and I think we had just on 1200 responses to the survey which we, we did recently and for anyone who's done engagement in Greenfields area it's often quite an apathetic audience and it's really difficult to get responses so I think 1200 responses is probably the greatest level of engagement I've seen um, in over my 10 years here at Camden Council which is really pleasing and I think really speaks to the inroads um, the council has made and our, our wonderful youth council and our youth officers as well but also the fact that the youth in Camden want to be part of that solution and I think that's that's a really strong message we're receiving and as I say something that we're really excited about um, moving forward um, so very much look forward to finalizing that strategy um, in the next year and continuing to work with the sector to build capacity to, to support our, our youth network and our partners such as Headspace and their partners as well to help expand on those Camden operations um, and help support our, our youth in Camden. That's it for me. Great, thank you. Thanks Tina. I think you've really um, summed up that dilemma that growth councils have which is what, what do you build for a community that doesn't yeah. exist yet? And, yep. um, you know, I love that analogy of trusting your gut and, um, you know, it will happen. Um, and it's often, you know, four, five, six years between the plans first being developed and the people arriving. So yeah, that's mm. great, yep. great initiative. Thank you. Um, I'll hand over now to Aysen, um, who's going to share her thoughts. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I guess before I start off um, uh, in talking about uh, the service being provided out of Camden, um, I think I should talk about a little bit about Headspace for those people that really don't know too much about Headspace. Um, Headspace is a youth mental health service um, for 12 to 25 year olds and it's based on the principles of preventative um, work that we should be doing um, with young people. Um, so prevention in terms of um, you know, young people's uh, social and emotional growth, I suppose. Um, so in that respect, we look after um, the mild to moderate end of, um, end of the mental health um, issues that young people may be confronted with. Um, and Headspace has always operated on the principle of it being um, a one-stop shop so to speak, so that um, if a young person needs access um, to another service, that service would be provided out of Headspace with their partners. So a lot of in-kind provision is done um, in-house and obviously for those services that can't operate out of in-house, then out of house as well. Um, I guess when I first started in Headspace, which is almost five years now, um, my job was to make sure that you know youth who, who really needed access um, and entry levels uh, soft point entry level into youth mental health were actually accessing um, what the services had to provide um, two years into the position um, what i noticed was um, i guess out of 
a sheer boredom one day, let's just say. I mean, for those people that work with me would know that I really love my stats um, and I thrive on numbers. Um, was looking through um, our, re our yearly report that had just come through. And I noticed that there was a section there that's, that had a distribution of postcodes, which sort of didn't attract my attention until that day. And I looked through it and I went, okay, this is really interesting that even though we're located in Campbelltown, that about close to about 30% of um, young people who were accessing our service was actually from the Camden LGA. Um, and when I talk about um, young people who are accessing our services, back then the numbers were close to 1,000. Today, they're over 1,000. Um, last count was 1,270 young people who'd accessed uh, the service in the last financial year. So um, that was a huge number. Um, and then it got, uh, I got to thinking and thought, okay, look, if this many people are accessing um, this service. How do they access our service? Because like, um, as Tina said, it's about a 15 minute drive on a good day. But if you're in peak hour traffic, it could take anywhere between, you know, 40 minutes to an hour from that end to this end. Um, and young people don't drive. 12 year olds, 13 year olds don't drive. Most parents don't drive as well, or they do drive, but they don't have cars. So it can cost a young person anywhere between um, $6 to about $10 uh, for a return bus fare back and forth from Campbelltown to Camden. Um, then we sat down with the general manager of operations, um, who's our lead agency is One Door Mental Health, um, and said, okay, we need to make this service accessible. If, if, if young people are accessing this service and we're based all the way out here, what's to say that you know, we're missing out on young people who actually want to access the service but don't have the monetary means and et cetera? And this is when Camden Council was building their beautiful buildings out at Oran Park. Um, and then Charisma and myself sat down and said, well, Charisma, you know, let's meet with these people, see what they can do, see how we can partner up in, in getting a headspace out there, at least in an outreach um, space. And that's exactly what we did. So Camden Council were very nice. Um, they offered us free rooms and offered to furnish it out for us and etc., which we're always very grateful of. Um, and then all of a sudden, our figures today, when I had a look at them, this is the latest figures, is that 41.6% of um, young people from Camden and the surrounds, or I'll say the greater MacArthur region, are accessing Headspace in Oran Park, which is huge. Um, it's almost half the number. Um, when we sort of um, approached the schools in the area, I think currently there are about 15 schools in the area, both um, public and private. Um, when we approached the schools in the area, the schools were very um, supportive of the fact that Headspace was there because it's not just about accessing mental health, it's also about the psychoeducation um, and the social education um, that young, uh, that young uh, people can receive and also about the capacity building that we have um, that we can offer the schools and other community agencies around us as well. So when Headspace opened up and Tina you're actually right we I think we opened up a couple of months after you guys opened up the building it was August 2018 um, a grand opening and I've never seen so many school students wanting to be part of that opening. Um, yes, we did invite a few schools, but we sort of asked for representatives, um, maybe, you know, a couple of students, but the number of students that actually turned up and the number of schools that which we didn't know existed that turned up to that opening was marvellous. Um, that in itself sort of explains, I suppose, or shows that Headspace, um, there was, there was a need for a headspace, I, I guess, um, not just in terms of providing the mental health, but for those, um, I suppose, young people and families and teachers alike and, um, and the community itself, um, fully knowing that you know, headspace can provide that sort of, um, the, 
the, the soft entry level points to other mental health services should young people require it. Um, because we have great partnerships with New South Wales Health, we have great partnerships with the Pacific Islander Group, which is one of the, the bigger groups in our communities. Um, and we also have really great relationships with the Aboriginal communities and the Aboriginal mental health centres as well. So, which just meant that if a young uh, person needed to, to be referred into another, uh, another service, it just made things that much more easier and accessible for them. I guess what we were thinking of when we um, sat down with Charisma and, and our general manager back then was, okay, we have this service, but we wanna see it accessed. How do we make it accessible? How do we say to the community out there, yes, there's a bright green sign that says Headspace, but how do we make sure that those right people are actually tapping into the services? How do we open our doors to them? Um, and it meant a lot of community development and community um, engagement, which Charisma took um, great pride in, in, in doing, so thank you. Um, it meant that we did a lot of, lot of hard work after hours to make sure that people actually heard that we've got offices out that way and that we're not afraid of being accessed. And just because we exist in council grounds doesn't make us, um, you know, um, bureaucratical in any sense that these are just free offices um, and that we've got the support of council to do this look in all honesty um, i think as headspace um, and as many years of being a psychologist um, i personally as well as the manager of headspace can't thank um, can the council enough um, for the effort that they've put in um, and for the support that they've shown us over the two years. Um, whether it was from, you know, giving us the free rooms or the furniture that came along with it or even the signage so that, you know, young people can, can see where we are. And we're not just talking, you know, just a little bit of a signage that says headspace is there, but you know, surrounded throughout council buildings so that people can actually see where we are. Um, and because we're in the library building, um, it just made sense because that's where youth hang out. It's a youth, it's a youthy space, it's a really funky space for youth to be in. Um, and it just meant that, you know, people who were walking through our doors weren't being judged because it was the library area. So nobody knows where a young person is going. They could be going to Headspace, they could be going to see one of our partners who we're working with alongside them, or they could be going into the library itself. Um, it's actually a very comfortable area um, to be working out of. And I think the relationship, I think council should embrace more of a relationship with their youth agencies because it shows the humane side or the humanness of what council is about too. And um, yes, as Tina was saying, we do think about, you know, sewage systems and I don't know um, anything else that's council related. But when we talk about council, we don't think about mental health. We don't talk about, um, you know, we don't think about um, how to tap into those, to those areas, the social, um, the social factors that make um, a, a suburb alive that make um, a suburb feel a little bit more human than, than you know your buildings and shopping centers and whatever else um, and I think that's what this was all about it was the relationship itself um, actually showed the community that council was actually willing to work within the social infrastructure as well and that community agencies itself um, can actually look at differing ways of partnering up with council that doesn't necessarily have to be the removal of unwanted furniture and whatever else is happening in and around them but it can actually be for service provision as well um, i guess when we look at figures and etc we know back then there was about 
six percent of the population that could actually t uh, you know tap into our services i think currently um if we have a look at the stats that tina presented and the stats that we have at hand it's almost um close to about 10 percent of the population that can uh, the age uh, between 12 and 25 that can actually tap into soft entry points for mental health and health related um, organisations in, in, in the Camden area. Um, I guess um, Headspace itself, um, we, we actually pride ourselves in partnering with Camden Council, I've got to be very honest, um, because because it shows the livelihood or um, the, the attention to detail of the community's needs there as well. Um, I can go into more detail, but I think that might do for now. <laughs> so I'll hand it over. Thanks, Asa, and that's great. And, you know, I really love that sense of the partnership and, um, you know, from both sides of the equation, not being, not being afraid to um, try new ways of doing things and think a little bit outside the square, which, you know, I think a lot of um, people working in this area just keep coming up against the same barriers each time. But, you know, there are other ways. So um, that's some great insights there. Thank you. I'll hand over now to Charisma, who's going to talk a bit about young people themselves and, um, and what advocacy and, and, you know, what we need to do from here. Thank you so much, Bronwyn. Um, so before I, I kind of touch on what young people's futures look like, I thought I might reflect on, um, on what young people view of their present and, and you know, what their current situation is through their own eyes. Every year, Mission Australia um, does a youth survey um, and surveys young people across the country. In 2019, um, their, the results of their survey highlighted some, some very interesting things about where young people were at. So they found that about 75% of young people were planning to go to university, TAFE or college. About 28% had uh, travel or gap year plans um, in place after completing year 12. That the, the three things that most young people valued were friendships, family relationships and uh, satisfaction in their school or study. And the three most important issues that they saw in Australia today are mental health, and that was for the third year running. Uh, environment, which significantly compared to 2018's results, and equity and discrimination. Um, the survey also found that um, most young people um, firstly go to their friends, then they go to a parent or carer or a family friend or relative uh, for help uh, with important issues in their lives. Um, Tina mentioned earlier that um, Camden Council is in the process of putting together a youth strategy and um, the initial results of the Camden Youth Survey really kind of reinforce and, and demonstrate that that exists in the camp amongst uh, young people in Camden as well. Um, and for the first time, the 2019 survey asked young people whether they felt they had enough of a voice on important issues. Um, interestingly enough, only 7.2% of young people felt that they had a say all of the time when it comes to public affairs. And in fact, more than half of them, about 52%, felt that they had a say none of the time when it, came, when it comes to public affairs. And about 40% of respondents either felt ambivalent, negative, or very negative about the future, which are all quite um, interesting things when you, when you keep in mind the fact that this snapshot is pre-COVID, it's pre-bushfires, and it's pre the Black Lives Matter movement gaining traction um, here in Australia as well. The results of this year's survey yet to be released, but it'll certainly look at, um, you know, provide some significant insights into how that, that snapshot may have changed given the, you know, the, the various um, things that have happened in 2020. Um, in reflecting on most of the conversations that I've had with young people in the last six months, one of the most common things um, to come up has been the impact of, um, of the events of 2020 on, on their motivation levels, which makes sense if you have a think about all the ways that our intrinsic and extrinsic motivators have been affected and the ongoing uncertainty faced by many young people 
um, even for what their post-COVID reality may look like. Um, we are officially in a, in, a, in a recession and recessions tend to hit young people and women the hardest. And even organisations that you wouldn't really expect um, have, have kind of uh, looked into the inter, in increasing intergenerational gap. So um, the Actuaries Institute um, recently released a, a green paper and they found that um, mainly because government spending is mostly biased towards an older demographic and asset prices have risen faster than incomes. Um, that's sort of driven a 20 year high in intergenerational inequality. And the, the sort of impacts of COVID, of the bushfires and of Black Lives Matter have really kind of laid bare some of the ways that that intergenerational inequality um, sort of affects young people on a daily basis. And so where previously a lot of this stuff was sort of, um, you know, part of the system and, and, and not really kind of impacting people on a daily basis, I think the events of the last sort of nine months have really kind of shown young people how this inequality and inequity affects them um, significantly. We know that um, for young people, um, we have a significant, you know, young people under 25 um, are more educated than previous generations, but they're poorer than their parents. Whilst um, they have better health, education and social outcomes, their economic housing and environmental outcomes are poorer. And when you think about it, councils and service providers like Headspace interact with um, all of those domains whether it's um, at a very grassroots level or at a more kind of, uh, you know, policy level, um, supporting a kind of uh, broader demographic. Um, the, I guess the idea that, um, that, that unfairness is, uh, is kind of, uh, you know, impacting young people um, into the future is, is obviously really being driven home by some of the impacts on uh, employment and the workforce and young people's disengagement with, um, with, their, with employment. So if you think back to some of the, the stats that we were talking about, you know, it's, it's about 28% uh, of young people thought they were going to go on a gap year or traveling this year. Obviously that, um, that may have significantly changed and 75% people were, were planning to, 75% of people were planning to go to university, TAFE or college. And um, again, that has been significantly impacted. And when you look at sort of some of the, um, you know, the policy discussions that are happening um, at, a at a few government levels, young people see that the changes that are being made to policy and government spending are increasingly hurting them. Um, whether it's changes to university fee structures or, uh, you know, the, the, the caps on places, all of these sorts of things are directly impacting them and, and their daily lives. And they're seeing it more and more in the media and they're, they're experiencing it more directly. Um, so, and, and obviously there's that, that, that kind of age old thing of, you know, not a month goes by without millennials or, or now Gen Z being labeled lazy, entitled or spoiled. Um, so that kind of, I guess, gets to the, um, the, the question of what role do advocacy bodies have in um, advocating for young people in kind of um, hopefully decreasing that sense of, um, of hopelessness when it comes to young people's ability to impact um, policy and, and change. And I think first and foremost, um, picking up on some of the threads that Tina and Nathan were talking about, um, it's really important to have genuine um, conversation and genuine consultation with young people. Um, part of the reason why, um, you know, Camden Council is such a joy to work with is because some of those structures are in place at multiple parts of the organisation. So not only do you have the Youth Council filled with young people who are, um, you know, amazing advocates for their peers, but you have, um, you know, youth workers and people in their community development team who are advocates for young people as well, through to um, people within the, um, you know, the executive level of the organisation who understand that supporting young people and, and having services for young people is a priority of the organisation. That is not something that exists um, at every council, I, I know, um, but I'm also kind of, um, you know, grateful to see that in my, my own council, where we do have very active um, community development team who I think there's a couple um, on the line today. Um, we, we have a very active community development team. We have, um, you know, a 
directors who um, who sort of advocate for young people um, and also champions at the sort of um, councillor and, and mayor level. Very recently, um, Liverpool's Youth Council celebrated 20 years as an organisation and um, it was it was quite significant because our mayor um, had in her first term of council proposed um, that the youth council be set up. So actually kind of looking at genuine ways to engage young people um, and having them be an equal part of the conversation, not just a tokenistic part of, um, of, of the conversation to, to tick a box and, you know, to, to say that we have done this. That's a really important part of, of advocacy, whether it's in a national body like the NGAA or whether it's um, at, a, at a council level. Um, so having champions and, and, and um, you know, people who may not necessarily be young, but who, um, who kind of promote the, the interests of, of young people as well is quite important. Um, apart from that, if there's one thing that this example has shown, it's the importance of, of collaboration and building partnerships with, um, with other organisations um, and, and kind of using that to, um, to progress change. So whether that is um, in, in terms of mental health resource allocation um, locally or, or Australia wide, or whether that is in terms of um, youth employment and advocating for, for changes so that we can address that problem as it, you know, as it sort of starts to affect more and more young people. Um, really kind of looking at um, what partnerships can be made um, in order to, to progress some of those discussions are quite important. So um, I might kind of throw back to you, Bronwyn, and kind of open up to, to questions. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Charisma. And yeah, some really important points there just about the current situation and I think that wrap around or that holistic view of what council can do to support, you know, a significant proportion of their resident population um, through what is a difficult time for everyone, but a particularly young people whose world is changing and their future is sort of moving further and further away from, from what they were expecting it to be. So um, thank you all. I will open up to questions. So if you'd like to um, type your question into the Q&A box, that would be great. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I might just kick off with one for Tina. And, and that is around, you know, we've heard this great feedback around Camden Council and the genuine um, commitment to young people throughout different levels. So what's changing post-COVID, while well, we're still in COVID, but how do you think that's going to change the way councils interact with young people? And, and then I might come down to Aeson after that to ask a similar question around how does mental health service provision change? Mm. So Tina first. Yeah, it's an interesting one. We actually um, started our, our youth strategy engagement pretty much in the midst of COVID. I, I think it's probably one of the very fortunate areas is that the youth are, are very good with technology and they've probably showed us a thing or two in terms of how we can continue on and the world does continue, um, despite the fact you can't do face-to-face -face meetings. So you know, our, our youth council in particular were probably one of the first of our, our committee groups that jumped onto the online forums and kept their meetings going and things like that. So they've been really proactive in that space. Um, we've also pivoted a lot to doing a lot of filming and I know that um, PJ, our, our youth officer, um, and the team have been doing a bit of filming and, and we've, we're about to do some more filming around a, another youth initiative we have um, called, um, I forget the name of it now, um, Creatives Take the Lead, that's what it was, which is about getting the, um, using entertainment and events and things like that to mentor um, young kids in terms of what they can do in those industries and we we're going to do that in a very much a face-to-face -face forum they were going to organize a big event and put it on at our, our civic center but COVID's completely curtailed that so what they've managed to do is to, to pivot that and, and do more of an online series with some videos and and things like that so I think they've probably showed us the way in a, a lot of respects which has been fantastic and as I think I've said and I think um, Charisma said as well we're very fortunate with our, our youth council and a lot of our youth leaders here in Camden I, I think we're, we're got some really strong advocates and they they really do you know have a strong voice but they they lead the way for us in a lot of respects as well interesting yep <laughs> definitely that shift to technology um, yep we can't go back can we we can't no. return to as <laughs> well <laughs> Aysen, your thoughts on on covid and post covid okay look um 
COVID, yes, COVID, I think COVID has taught us a lot of things. Um, as Tim is saying, you know, the use of technology and et cetera, becoming a, a, like our, the extension of our fingertips, basically, it's become part of our bodies. Um, I think uh, we, we never closed throughout COVID. So we, we, we considered essential workers um, and because we're a government funded program, we were asked to remain open um, and we were, but we limited our face to face, obviously, uh, for the safety of everybody. Um, and what we found was that during COVID itself, the numbers that I record, that, that I sort of rattled off at the beginning, um, actually the, the, the numbers that was accessing the service increased. Um, so, just to put it in perspective, last year, I think we uh, last year, 20, uh, the 2019 financial year, we sort of delivered um, just under 4,000 occasions of service, which basically means we saw, um, we delivered some sort of a service to, to young people 4,000 times. Um, this year, the number is 5,476. And that, that is the last quarter. So, and that's COVID, that's during COVID. Um, I think the, the number of people that, young people who were tapping into um, our services increased as a result of COVID, um, but increased in respect that we had increased our services, the extension of our service. So it's no longer just face-to-face. -face. We could actually go out to people in the comfort of their homes or in the security of a friend's place or grandma's place, wherever they were, or in the school grounds. Um, and as a result, I think, yes, COVID is a bad thing, which we never experienced at all and et cetera. But in saying that, it has also um, allowed services and businesses and communities to look at other ways of tapping into what normally would have been face-to-face. -face. And as a result, um, service extension came out of it and service growth came out of it as well. Yeah. Let's see what happens after COVID. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, I love that sense of um, understanding both the importance of having a physical presence, you know, like, you know, an actual office or building or somewhere to anchor the service, but also, you know, being accessible, you know, at grandma's house or at your friend's place. I think, I think that's a fantastic way to really meet a diverse need. Um, yeah, so in Charisma, talking about, um, you know, new communities and, and people coming from all different sorts of backgrounds, and we know there's a high um, level of new migrants who move to greenfield sites. Um, what are some, you know, in your experience with young people, what are those sort of cultural barriers? Are, are there things that, you know, councils can do to assist um, crossing over those cultural barriers about seeking assistance? Yeah, I guess um, as um, Tina and Aysen were saying earlier, um, a lot of the the new sort of residents coming in to Camden, um, to Campbelltown, um, and to the the greater southwest really um, are people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. Um, are people who um, you know are, are perhaps purchasing their their first home and and kind of you know building building their life with their family. Um, I'll draw an example from um, something that we've, um, we've done at Headspace uh, Campbelltown for the last couple of years, which is um, a try and, and um, address some of the unmet needs of the Pacifica community. So Campbelltown um, has a, a, one of the highest sort of culturally linguistically diverse groups is um, the it, are people from the Pacific Islands background. And um, we knew sort of in terms of st uh, stats at the centre that young people from a Pacific background were not necessarily coming in and accessing services um, through Headspace, but we knew anecdotally from speaking to members of the community that the need was there, that there were young people who were experiencing mental health and wellbeing issues. So um, one of the, the first things that um, I guess 
I was involved in um, when I started at Headspace was um, it's very interesting morning tea, bringing together um, members of the Pacifica community, um, health professionals from a Pacifica background, um, and obviously Headspace workers as well. And um, the thing that struck me about that was the really sort of full, frank and honest discussion where, um, and I think uh, Aysen was probably, um, Aysen probably had a bit of a tough, was on the receiving end of some tough, um, tough questions. But basically it was an opportunity for um, the community members themselves to say, this is why our young people are not accessing your service. And this is what we need in order to, um, to kind of address that balance. And as a result of that, um, the recommendations provided by um, those community members were taken up um, and they included having an identified um, Pacifica clinician on site. Um, and the thing with, um, with say, an identified uh, worker from a particular cow background is that it can kind of go both ways. On the one hand, it can actually kind of um, help with engagement. So um, a young person might, might sort of say, oh, look, you know, this person from a similar cultural background um, probably gets some of the, the cultural issues at play here so perhaps stigma or um, you know some of the, the the issues that might be specific to um, within that community but it can also go the other way where a young person might be afraid of um, you know uh, word getting out that they're accessing mental health and being service uh, mental health and well-being services to other members of of their community and and then being very uncomfortable however the that choice and the, the ability for young people to have that choice of um of of seeing a clinician from a similar cultural background was really significant um and what that also enabled us to do was to um search out opportunities to um, to meet young people from that cultural background where they were at, whether that was at schools, whether that was at um, you know with sporting clubs or other community organisations, um, we were really flexible with how we went out and and kind of um, talk to talk to those young people about what headspace. Campbelltown is, what it looks like, who is there, um, and why they should walk through the door. Because um, that sort of initial reduction of, um, of the barrier is, is incredibly significant. And, I, and that's sort of a lesson that I think we can carry to our engagement with other um, culturally and linguistically diverse communities where the really sort of basic things you need are the ability to have that really honest conversation and empower that community to, um, to let you know what it is that they need in order to engage um, better with your service and feel like they're being respected and feel like their needs are important to us as a service um, and the other thing is um, is obviously you know being very flexible in how you are meeting um, meeting where the, where the community is at or where those young people are at because sometimes um, if they they come across you at school it can be um, open up conversations and, and kind of um, you know get them to sort of um, access the service by, by talking about things like confidentiality, by talking about um, the fact that no, you know, their parent doesn't or carer doesn't need to know that they're accessing a service if that's what they're concerned about. Um, and no, you know, just because they come in and, and, and see someone doesn't mean that their um, auntie, cousin, whoever um, will also know about it. Yeah, really good point. Um, it sort of reminds me of this whole concept that local government is moving around around sort of place-based and people focused service deliveries so yeah it's good to hear we're sort of on the same page but um i've just got a question in around reaching young people on social media and sometimes councils you know can be a little hesitant to do that but tina are you is it is it a broader um council communication strategy as well to reach young people yeah oh yeah very much so um yeah we've been uh, quite active on our, our social media front and in terms of communicating with our wider community during COVID, um, but particularly with, with youth. And we actually ran our youth week online this year because obviously yeah. we didn't have face-to-face -face events. So yeah. we were resorted to an online platform and it was highly successful. We've also done a, a 
series of events called Smash the Silence, um, which is around based around music and, and youth mental health. Um, and we've live streamed that, those performances on Facebook as well. So mm. yeah, it's been been a saviour in, in some respects to, to the communications um, during COVID. Yeah. And, and just to, you know, the, the audience more widely, it, it seems to be the go-to now as opposed to no one picks up papers anymore. I think they've stopped printing the papers <laughs> during COVID. So, you know, it's, it's really important that we do embrace that. Um, we are probably about 12 months ago now expanded our social social media platforms. Previously, we really only had Facebook. So we, we now have pretty much all of the, the um, social media platforms and you know, Snapchat and all the rest of it. So wow. it's, it's been a really you know, big piece for us to take that step. And you know, as you say, councils can be hesitant to embrace it because the more forums you're on, the more opportunities there are for, for negative press. Yeah. Um, but we've, we've got a really strong social media strategy that, that really utilizes it for the communication aspect of it. And that's been really successful. Mm -hmm. Right, um, I might try and wrap up a bit then because I know that um, securing a headspace presence is a top advocacy priority for a number of our members. And so, uh, so I suppose what we've heard today is it's hard to build a case on evidence when the community is brand new or doesn't quite exist yet. But at the same time, you know, hearing from agencies and service providers and youth workers um, that there is data out there on who's accessing services and where they're located. So I suppose the lesson there is to, to really work very closely with those agencies in your local community and service providers in the region to, to really build your evidence base. And then I suppose it's also about just being brave enough to go it alone and for council to take that, um, that first step and actually say, here's, here's the space. Uh, please use it because, you know, I think um, there's a lot of, uh, I suppose, requests just for straight funding for a headspace presence in a community. Um, and there are limits on that. And we can ask the government time and time again for, for more funding for service delivery. But um, this is a really pragmatic way that Camden Council has made it happen. So uh, I think it's it speaks very positively about council's commitment to its community and um, it shows that new way of doing things, which is to, to not rely on, on direct government funding for things. Sometimes you just have to take that brave step. So um, were there any last comments from the panelists? Anyone like to, to make any final comments before I, before I close up the meeting? No? <laughs> I was just gonna say, um... In terms of social media, um, that's probably been one of my biggest learning curves this year. Um, my colleagues will tell you that um, they're sick of me making TikToks. Um, and, but the, the thing that I also have learned is that it um, is not a replacement for an overall communi communication strategy or an engagement strategy with young people, especially at the moment where digital overwhelm is such a big thing. Mm. There's so much content. Every organisation that can't sort of, you know, provide service in person is shifting things to, to online and social media. And so young people are kind of, you know, being overwhelmed by a tsunami of information. And so sometimes going back to old school analogue and, and actually having a number of different ways of engaging with your stakeholders or engaging with, um, with young people is really, really important um, because otherwise your message gets lost. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you. Sorry, Asa, were you going to say something? I was, yeah, I was just going to, to, to just touch on a point that you made whilst you were wrapping up. Mm -hmm. um, I just, yeah, when, um, when councils are actually backing up uh, youth mental health services such as Headspace and etc to, to coexist and, and deliver services out of their offices. Um, just a note that we, we do that out of our own expenses. So we, we don't get extra funding for, mm. for personnel. We don't get any extra funding, um, I don't know, to, to buy more resources and etc. So we, we make do with... Um, I mean, it's no secret, we get a million dollars funding each year. So 
it was out of that million dollars that we we made that work and and that was one of the reasons why we couldn't afford to pay rent um, for another premise and I think um, if there's councils out there who are willing to support a headspace centre um, it's not necessarily about monetary um, sponsorship it's actually got a lot to do with providing them with the, that safe and secure space and and making sure that you know that the doors are open and access and there's accessibility of services that's available for young people and of course um, you know being um, positive and supportive towards the personnel that are actually doing it out of their own time and effort mm. yeah, to make mm. it work. Yeah. It's, it's a passion um, and councils need to have that passion. And I think those people who are thinking of, oh, I want to take my headspace out there, um, need to have that passion as well. Yeah. 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 That's a great note to end on. Thank you, Aysen. Um, I really appreciate um, Tina, Aysen and Charisma, your time and, and the effort you've put into preparing for today. Um, I know, you know, there's a lot of information we've taken from it and, and, and hopefully, you know, a lot of councils now um, perhaps rethinking some of their strategies around um, approaching youth mental health. Um, in growth areas. So thank you all very much. And um, we'll be, we're taking a break on webinars during all of the national school holiday periods. So we'll be back um, in mid-October um, with another webinar coming up on the economic impact of COVID on growth area economies and what we do about getting people back to work um, when it's all over. So thank you very much, everyone.